before we start, if you're enjoying these conversations, please make sure that you like or subscribe to Cleaning Up. It really helps other people to find us. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation. Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich, and this is Cleaning Up. My guest today is an energy thoroughbred. It's Dev Sanyal, CEO of Varro Energy Group based in Zug, Switzerland. Before that, he had a 32-year career with BP, where he was on the group executive committee responsible for gas and for clean energies. The energy transition is not just about stopping doing the old and focusing entirely on the new. It is, as it says on the tin, a transition. To hear about it, let's bring Dev Sanyal into the conversation here on Cleaning Up. So, Dev, welcome to Cleaning Up. Thank you, Michael. It's always a pleasure to see you. Now, where are you calling from today? I'm sitting right now in uh, Zug in Switzerland. It's actually quite an overcast day, so there's maybe a bit of rain, which is probably a good thing, given it's been a dry, hot summer. Right now, Zug is all to do with your job with Varro Energy. Um, that's not somewhere that you live. When you and I first met, you were with BP, right? Absolutely. Some years um, ago. Some so years ago. Uh, you have a 30-year history with BP, but we didn't go back quite that far. But I probably met you, I'm going to guess, something like 15 years ago. What were you, what were you, remind me what you would have been doing then? So at that point, I was um, actually uh, the group treasurer of BP and uh, running BP's finances uh, at the time. And subsequently, I uh, moved on to the executive uh, committee of BP, where I served for 12 years and ran the um, natural gas business worldwide, as well as the uh, low carbon energy business of BP. Right, and that's when we first really started to interact, was when you started to do the low carbon uh, activities and lead them at BP. Uh, but your job now is as CEO of Varro Energy. And where I'd like to start is actually asking you to give a thumbnail of Varro Energy, because it's not a household name in the way that BP is. So what is it that Varro does? So um, as you said, Michael, I joined Varro on the 1st of January of this year, and I'm actually based full time in Switzerland. But of course, the company has diverse operations in different parts of the world. Uh, we are essentially an integrated uh, energy company. And what we try and do is uh, help our customers uh, both meet their needs for energy in terms of energy security, but we are also helping our customers decarbonize. So we're also helping their own transition. Uh, the heart of our company is in Europe, but we've got operations elsewhere as well. So the business essentially has got two engines, as I call it. Uh, engine one is a conventional energy business, uh, which is uh, essentially midstream to downstream to all the way to the customer and consumer. And that business uh, is all about how do we optimize it? How do we make more efficient? How do we reliably supply our customers? Uh, at the same time, how do we increasingly decarbonize that business? And we've done a lot of work in that respect, 300,000 tons of reductions uh, just this year, uh, as an example. We're operating at around 98% reliability across 50 assets. And Engine 2 is a business that is uh, growing. Uh, we actually have a pretty significant business in what we call uh, sustainable energies, uh, but we've identified five strategic growth pillars to grow the business in advanced biofuels, advanced uh, biomethane, bio LNG, uh, in green hydrogen, in nature-based carbon solutions, as well as uh, e-mobility. So that's what we do. And of course, uh, at the heart of what we do is serving our customers, helping them uh, to transition. And so we've got what we call these customer lighthouses, working with four specific sectors, uh, process heat, uh, aviation, uh, wholesalers, as well as food retailers to help them uh, decarbonize and meet uh, their own emission targets. And of course, you can help your customers, you can also help yourself. So we've also announced in July of this year, this new strategy, which I've just articulated, and we've also uh, announced a plan to be net zero by 2040 for scope one, scope two, and scope three. Okay, now there's a huge amount there, and we're going to have to unpack it, um, because although we've got some in the audience who would have you know, followed every word, 
and understood it and, uh, and, and, and followed it. There are also some who come from different backgrounds. And so we're going to have to sort of break this down a little bit. And you've got your engine one, which is conventional, and you've got to improve that. And then also that throws off capital. And then you've got your engine two, which is all the low carbon, the zero carbon and so on. But I want to let's start with engine one. And you talk you because you, you use words and we use words like oh, midstream and downstream. Let, let's be, let's let's really make this concrete. So midstream is refineries. That's you call that manufacturing as well. Right. But it's really refineries. And what what energies are we talking about? Um, it's not coal, is it? But is it is it um, uh, the what, full spectrum of fuels? Is it gas? What, what what's your mix? So uh, what we don't do, um, I'll start there if I may, Michael. Yeah, that's, go, that's always a good place. Make yeah, it very clear what you don't do. Exactly. Don't produce oil and gas. Uh, you know what's called the upstream. So what we do is uh, we uh, basically process uh, oil as well as bio. Uh, in our own uh, refining system. The business in engine one, what is a conventional energies business, is actually around, if you will, the slate of fossil-based fuels, uh, as well as uh, we've also got a very, very significant position in bio blending. So we are actually one of the largest bio traders uh, in Europe. Uh, so that is our business in uh, engine one, which is- uh, And how many- can, can I ask how many refineries have you got? So just to be very clear, number two, you've got Cressier, you've yeah. got Bayern Oil. Yeah, and and basically uh, those are the two key, uh, what we call manufacturing hubs. Uh, in Bayern Oil, you've got sort of two components, okay. Start and Warburg, and then we've got uh, assets, uh, around 50 of them, where we basically store and distribute uh, and optimize uh, the value chain, by which I mean uh, make sure that we can efficiently and safely uh, supply our customers. So that will be that will be you, so you move it around, you blend it, you store it, and you trade, you market it, you trade it. And what's the mix between fuel between liquids and gases? We are predominantly um, a, a liquids business today, um, and uh, both in terms of um, you, you know what you'd call conventional energies, gasoline, diesel, and the like as well as uh, the bio business, uh, which is, of course, a liquid based uh, a renewable fuel. Uh, so that's where we are predominantly uh, focused on. We do, um, you know, have a business uh, in LPG, et cetera, but that's relatively small in the context of uh, what has been uh, historically a predominantly uh, liquid based business. OK, and, and I think this is really useful. I find it very useful and hopefully for the audience also, because it's very easy for a lot of people to use words like, you know, um, oil companies or gas companies or oil and gas companies that without really understanding what the food chain looks like from exploration, development, extraction, which you don't do through the refining, through moving around, blending it, trading it, and so on. You talked about having 50 assets. Those would be, that's not officers. Those are physical. That's where you're actually touching the stuff, correct? Absolutely. Uh, you know, storing it, manufacturing it, trading it, um, and, and distributing it. Okay. And what is the split? If you can just give us a sort of rough, is it is it 50-50 conventional versus clean now is it 80 20 is it 90 10 just on any metric whether you know volume or or, or whatever just give us an idea of that well our, our business in uh, what we call engine 2 or uh, sustainable energies is relatively uh, small in terms of manufacturing in terms of um, you know uh, effectively the the overall sort of share of the pie um, so what we intend to do is invest in five strategic pillars, which I laid out in advanced uh, biofuels and advanced uh, biomethane, bio LNG, in nature based carbon solutions in green hydrogen, as well as e-mobility. And in the next five years, 50% of our earnings will come from those businesses to do so, we will basically deploy two thirds of our capital in these new businesses. And I think what's interesting about this strategy, at least I think it is, is that um, it's not one of those strategies that in the year 2070, it's gonna be fantastic, but by which time, I don't think I'll be around, maybe you'll be around. Um, uh, this has got a sort of, you know, a very clear tram line in terms of the next five years, where we are essentially gonna take 
two thirds of our capital, invest in these businesses and create 50% of our earnings in that period. And that's, I think, uh, obviously uh, challenging, but it's uh, something that I feel very confident about, not because uh, of just feeling confident about this energy transition, but because you've actually got businesses in those five um, uh, strategic pillars. What we need to do now is scale them up. So we have, if you will, the foundations. Now the question is getting the North Star uh, firmly inside and prosecuting it in a way which is safe and reliable. Okay, now this is great because what this is, is a snapshot of something you could almost call an energy transition because you've got a business which is predominantly conventional with the first beginnings of clean. And now you're gonna be putting two thirds of your capital into the clean and one third, presumably, into maintaining the conventional. But let me ask you this, because- Can some I of clarify one point on that, uh, Michael? Uh, the one third is what we call sustaining capital expenditure. You do need to invest to keep your assets running safely and reliably. So the in intent here is to basically optimize the existing infrastructure. And just because of the scale of it, you do need to have capital, which you deploy, to uh, keep it running at a high level of efficiency and reliability. Right, and that's exactly the the issue I was sort of going to start probing for because um, the IEA is being cited very frequently as having said we should be investing zero in fossil fuels to get to a one and a half degree future. The answer is zero investment. It's not one third, and then of you know what you've just described, it, and that's not actually what the IEA said. What they actually said is zero. Um, there's no need for new investment that's not already committed or in fields that are not already uh, developed or have been committed to in 2021 is what they actually said. But nevertheless, there are a lot of people out there saying the number on your conventional business should be zero. Don't you realize there's a climate crisis and so on? What do you say if you have somebody quite stridently putting that point to you? Listen, I think um, at the end of the day, uh, we have to provide both energy security uh, as well as, uh, and by which energy security, I mean reliable, affordable energy. At the same time, we also have to make a transition. I think what this current tragedy in the Ukraine has demonstrated is the complete asymmetry between production and consumer demand. Uh, the truth is four countries control 50% of oil resources and 50% of gas resources. In any other industry, that would be kind of anathema. I mean, it would not be acceptable. And yet we are here. So the question is, how do you transition away from that narrative? I wish it was as easy as, easy would be the wrong word, but uh, as straightforward as telephony. You know, when I left India as a young man to go to university in America, there were 10 million phone lines in India. And today, here we are, you know, many years later, I won't tell you the years, uh, it, it's still 10 million phone lines in India, but there are 890 million mobile phones. That is not the energy system where you can basically junk the old and kind of just invest in the new. So we've got to make this transition, which means in the current business, you can't just say, I'm going to just produce more energy. Yes, you do need to provide more energy because the world needs more energy and the transition will take some time. But you also have to go look at ways and means to decarbonize it. I'll give you an example. 70% of the hydrogen in Switzerland is consumed by us, by Varro. Now, if you convert that from gray to green, that is a good example of what you can do within your existing system. We are building the largest uh, ground-mounted solar facility in Cressier, which we'll commission uh, next year. 70% at peak, uh, between 60 to 70% at peak of uh, the refinery power requirements will come from solar. That's another good example of what we can practically do in terms of existing assets. So what I tell people is that, you know, it cannot be just one dimension. We have to meet the needs of more demand, 30% more demand in the next uh, couple of decades. We have to make it more affordable, which is obviously a big subject of today. Uh, and at the same time, we have to make this transition. And, and that's, I think, the task ahead of us. And just to say we will provide security without any of the above doesn't work. You've got to work uh, on all three dimensions 
And, and that's why I actually believe repurposing the existing infrastructure is as important as building new infrastructure. Uh, because the truth is uh, the existing infrastructure is not a stranded asset. A manufacturing hub, we don't call it refineries, by the way. We in VAR, we call them manufacturing hubs. I can see, and our strategy is founded on this fundamental belief that we will basically convert all our manufacturing hubs to clean energy um, centers. Uh, for example, with bioenergy, with green hydrogen, etc. So I think that's the way I sort of hold it, which is don't sort of freeze time, but don't sort of just look at one dimension, try and sort of bring things together and make progress, but also, and this is why I think our ESG strategy and what we've laid out in terms of net zero by 2040 is very important. It isn't a hockey stick where in 2039, magically it's going to be wonderful when I'm long right. retired. So it's kind of how do you measure it all the way through so that we can make tangible progress in all these dimensions. Right. Now, I want to come back to you've been very clear about it's not just 2040. You've got your 2030 uh, goals. And, uh, uh, and and I want to come back and, and push on some of those and, and get to engine two. We can talk about some of the businesses on your sort of clean energy side. But as we record this, um, there is this. Um, tragedy going on with the Russian invasion of Ukraine on top of what was already a price spike, right? It's not correct to say it's just about Ukraine because the as we came out of COVID, there was this kind of bubble of demand. Everybody who had saved up during that period started spending money and you've got the supply chains all fractured. And so there was already a spike last year. And this has very much come to a head. And of course, as we record this, we've also got in the UK... Um, a new prime minister assembling her team. So if I could, if we could divide things up, if we, if, if possible, into what would sort of, you know, what's happening now, you know, any advice that you would have for the incoming team and so on. So what's happening now versus let's call it through till 2030, which is a lot easier to talk about. And then 2030 to 2040. Um, so the, because I think, it, 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 you know, what's happening now is so front of mind and it will condition what we're going to do by 2030. Are we going to, you know, sort of forget climate for two years and just focus on energy security? And if so, what does that look like? I mean, what, what would your advice be? Well, I don't know if I'm the one to give advice, but I certainly have views, which, uh, as you know, Michael, I'll express very freely yeah. to you. Th 30, 30, 40 years in the energy sector, you, you know, I'm sorry, but you have a voice and we want to hear it, you know? <laughs> no, you know, here's what I would say. The current crisis is born of a number of things. Uh, number one, I would say, is a fundamental asymmetry, which I spoke about before. I mean, it is astonishing. When I started my career 32 years ago, uh, the total market share of Russian oil in Germany was 40% and Russian gas was 45%. And here we are many semesters later and it's identical. So the reality of course is that this asymmetry has I think been brought into sharp focus. And so we have got to diversify and you can't do this overnight. But if you sort of just try and keep the old gig and sort of put a bit of Band-Aid and hope it's gonna work, it doesn't. Because at some point in the future, some other nation state may decide, well, guess what? We're not going to provide as reliably as we have in the past the uh, products that you've got to use to create everyday prosperity. So that's the first bit I would actually emphasize. How do you diversify? Which means you've got to look at what you do today as reliably as possible. I'm very proud of our uh, track record as a company. You know, if from the start of the crisis, the 24th of February, we took a decision. Uh, we would not buy Russian crude. We would not uh, actually deal with Russian counterparties. It's a decision that um, I think was taken with imperfect information, but it was the right thing to do. And we took it on the first day. I have to tell you, I didn't quite expect the reaction from our customers and frankly, our staff, who absolutely thought it was the right thing to do. But what we have been able to do is operate our assets reliably. There's more work to be done. I don't feel complacent. So you've got to make sure you operate assets safely and reliably. We've got to make sure we uh, 
open up trading windows, trading opportunities to kind of optimize the flow of molecules and electrons, by the way. Uh, and number three, uh, we've got to make sure that we are sort of keeping in concert with our customers uh, requirements and demands so that we can be a reliable supply, which is why since the 24th of February, we have been uninterrupted in our supplies. And by the way, just as an example, one of 10 liters in Germany is supplied by Varro, three of 10 liters in Benelux is supplied by Varro, uh, around the same in, in Switzerland, etc. So very, very important we do that, uh, you know, make sure that we operate what we have well, but don't stop there. You've got to continue the narrative around diversification, which is very important. Now, the second area that I think has been, I think, brought to sharp relief is the demand uh, for the new uh, has not actually been as baked in as the degradation of supply of the old. So this is also a story of underinvestment over the course of the last, let's call it, um, you know, to 2015 onwards when, when we had that price drop in, in oil prices. And uh, the truth is that if you have a stop and start cyclicality of investments, there will be impacts, not immediately, and so you think it's all okay, not tomorrow, but it's all okay. But then down the road, those impacts become more and more apparent. So I think making a consistent set of decisions and having an environment that enables consistent decisions is very important because the system is so large that you, you know you don't feel the immediate impact but over time you do and we are actually in that point where you know i mean michael i want to forecast this we are sitting here with inflation which is reaching double digits uh, uh you know for this entire generation uh, who joined our industries for 15 years they don't know what a high interest rate looks like we do because we're a bit older if i may be so bold to suggest that the second is we've had massive supply chain dis uh, disruptions because the entire mantra of just in time which we celebrated has kind of been challenged for no doubt about it and the globalization sort of narrative of the last three decades has been challenged um, number three we've had obviously this terrible tragedy uh, of the Russian invasion of uh, the Ukraine. And number four, we've also had behind us uh, a, a massive pandemic, which has created dislocations in the labor market. Uh, and I just don't mean dislocations in a in the sense of the way economists talk about it, even mindsets and people sort of, you know, the great resignation, things like that. So all these things have come together at the same time. And that's why I think what we need to kind of address, how do we get to fundamentally diversification and an investment cycle that is enabled consistently to kind of create a more stable situation or equilibrium, if you will. Absolutely, and I think what you've just described, um, I call it the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which which all kind of hit in 2021, 2022. Um, you've got the pandemic, you've got the inflation, uh, you've got the the uh, Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine, and you still got you've still got the climate crisis. And you know, if you look at what's been happening in in Pakistan, you look at the heat waves in India, and and so on. It's all happening. And I guess it, it, what's really um, challenging is that you're still solving this multivariate problem. You can't just say it's now all back to energy security. I want to ask you about one thing, though. Um, you mentioned the falling off of investment. You know, it, it, this is the transition, right? We're talking a transition where you, you've got one third investment in the old and two thirds you're moving into the new. Um, but then... Last week, I had on this show Bill McKibben, who is as close as it comes to the father of the divestment movement. I mean, he's an he's a an elder statesman of no more investment in fossil. Uh, and, you know, in some ways, I actually challenged him as well, is responsible for that, um, that the pushback against investment in fossil. If he was here on this call with us, what would you say to him? I, I think we can't go overnight from one narrative to another. It, it's not like, as I said earlier, uh, telephony, where you can go from fixed lines to mobile phones. I think this transition uh, requires a complete replumbing. I think the IE has got it probably right. You know, is it $2 trillion uh, every year for the next uh, decade and $5 trillion every year beyond that? Um, I mean, you could debate the numbers, but this is a significant sum of money required. And if it happens too quickly, 
Um, there is no financial capacity to do that, number one. But I also don't think the money will be spent as wisely. So, you know, two trillion is a hell of a lot compared to, if you will, an oil and gas investment cycle over the last decade of, let's call it anything between 300 to $500 billion a year. So it's a, it's a huge stimulus, if you will. Now, there are things that are happening that will stimulate it further, like the Inflation Reduction Act, which I think is actually going to be good in terms of diversification. Um, but I think my own response would be, um, I wish it would be done as soon as possible. You know, I fundamentally believe in the energy transition. I think it's important. I believe there's a massive business opportunity. I think it's the right thing to do. And society needs it and demands it and wants it. But the question, of course, is how do we do it in a responsible fashion so that we don't have a situation where people are left behind, which is why I'm so passionate about, as you can sense, uh, and you know this, Michael, you and I know each other well, about repurposing of existing infrastructure. I want to not just repurpose infrastructure, I want to retreat because the same skills will be required. Go to a bio refinery. It's the same skill. The only difference is how do carbon zone flow through it? So we've got to look at this from multi dimensions, which is how do we provide the energy the world needs in the way that it wants? How do we help people in their own transition from one set of skills to another set of skills? Uh, and how do we actually do this in a cost effective way, use existing assets rather than waste money by creating a whole bunch of new assets, which require steel and land and everything else do it in a lot more of an efficient fashion it doesn't mean we can repurpose everything it doesn't mean that repurposing is the only panacea but i think there's been a fascination in the last decade um i don't know if you agree with me but i think there's been a fashion fascination with building the new and because it's kind of cool to go and do a ribbon cutting ceremony for a brand new shining asset i think the next decade is my own bet and that's a bet we're making as a company is that it'll be both uh, uh, repurposing the existing while also uh, building the new. Now, I think, you know, one thing we do need to do is make sure we've got the right signals for that investment climate. So sort of, you know, sudden changes in the investment legislation don't help um, because it kind of detracts from investor confidence. Uh, things like the Inflation Reduction Act, which actually kind of incentivize greater production is fantastic. I Personally, I believe it's also easy sometimes to incentivize consumption. That's probably a wrong thing. In fact, if you look at the latest poll, I looked at the UK, and there are so many polls these days, but 70% said they'd be up for actually reducing their own energy consumption over the course of this winter. Now, worryingly, 23% said they would have no access to, um, to uh, you know, uh, heating in the winter, which is not good. You only have to go to Japan the summer over since Fukushima, and you know, you will see that the temperatures in offices yeah. are uh, 24 degrees for a reason, because conservation. Sorry, go ahead. But, but when, you, when you talk about what 70% say in the UK, um, something like that would actually say that we should be nationalizing energy companies. And if not that, then we should be applying a windfall tax to companies that are um, you know, enjoying what they would consider, what a lot of people would consider to be excess returns resulting from the Russian invasion of Ukraine and these other sort of temporary uh, and very extreme situations. I mean, your own refinery margins, I'll bet right now, are at, are they at record highs? I suspect they will be, right? Well, I think what is very important is to basically be clear about what you do with that money. And if you're going to reinvest it, as we are doing, in creating new uh, forms of energy, creating, if you will, more energy, full stop, that actually will help abate the, the, the current challenge we are facing. But not, but not immediately, Dev. It won't immediately, because whatever you take out of the business now, and you then, you know, that, that enables you to take a final investment decision on, on the stuff we're going to get onto and talk about in your engine too. But that's not going to come online for two, three, four years. And people are really suffering today. So they would say, take those profits away from you and put them and, and help people who are perhaps not going to be able to run their heating this winter. I mean, how do you answer that? Yeah, listen, I mean, um, it is a, it's a very difficult situation. The cost of living uh, crisis, and it is a crisis, is real. I mean, because we are still experiencing all those factors. We talked about the, as you call it, the four horsemen apocalypse. 
Um, I think the question therefore is, how do you kind of deal with not only the present, but also how to get out of the present? And that means there needs to be investments. The only way out of this is producing more energy and actually creating more diversification and creating the signals that basically stop it would be, I think, probably not the right thing to do from my you know, uh, vantage point, because I actually believe if we can sort of create the conditions for certainty and conditions where the money gets invested in the future, then, you know, we will uh, undoubtedly get more energy and we'll have more diversified energy. It's going to be good for the consumer and good for the absolute uh, level of, you know, price, etc. Now, what do you do with the present? The governments will have many uh, options ahead of them. I sort of uh, quite, I, I sort of like this idea of, you know, making sure that it's very directed, the assistance, because, you know, quite frankly, you and I don't need that assistance. Uh, so how do you make sure it's very directed? And those are things politicians will look at, uh, uh, absolutely. But the worst thing we could do is just get focused on today, because you'll never get out of this trough. Uh, and we need to get out of this trough. And that takes time. I wish, Michael, trust me, I wish we could do this sooner. I mean, we've been very aggressive, five years, to build up these new businesses. Uh, but we actually have conviction we can do that. And that conviction is based on a number of things. A belief that customers want it and customers absolutely want it in our neighborhood. Number two, governments have to help incentivize it. I mean, just look at what's happened to uh, the UK with offshore wind. Uh, it was not developed by just great engineering. It was also developed by incentives that created the scale, which now has resulted in a, a virtuous cycle. Solar is the same example in America, etc. And then I think you do need, at the same time, uh, a consistent level of investment, so not a stop and start. And and that stop and start, we've seen this. You know, Peter had in the UK with CCS. Stop and start, what did that do? Actually, nothing came good out of it, other than some good engineering designs. So we've got to create that sort of a stable uh, environment for that investment to be, you know, sown so that we can reap the benefits in the future. Right. And, you know, you know um, that I, um, I'm pushing you, but I've also spent a big chunk of the last 20 years tracking stop-start policy. You know, in the US, there was the stop-start policy on production tax credits, and we saw it. I, was, I, I remember the charts we produced where uh, every year where there was a production tax credit, there'd be lots of wind, and then there'd be none, and then there'd be lots, and then there'd be none. And of course, then the other example is Spain, mm -hmm. where there was a retroactive, um, in a sense, nationalization of profits from renewable energy producers, and it probably harvested a few billion for government, but it resulted in a 10-year investment drought when investors shunned Spain and the Mediterranean countries for investment because they said, well, we don't know what's safe. So, yes. you know, you're, you're preaching to the converted, but you understand I wanted to push you because no, no. The, the audience hasn't had the same um, scar tissue that, that, that we've been tracking. I promise to let you talk about 2030 and, and beyond 2040. Um, and, and let's get on to that. So you've got... Um, net, you've got your um, net zero scopes one, two, and then three. Remind us which ones is it by which year, and then we'll get on to your engine two. So what you've said is scope one, scope two, we'll be reducing it by 40% in the next eight years, and we'll be net zero by 2040. Uh, we'll reduce carbon intensity for scope three by 15% in the next eight years and we will be net zero by 2040. Now, one thing that I want to be very clear about, I am not saying there will be no hydrocarbons in the energy mix. There will be, but we probably will not be participating in that in any significant way, uh, because we actually want to build at scale our engine two businesses in uh, renewable and sustainable energies and repurpose our existing business in conventional energies. But can, can I ask you about that? Because um, one way to achieve that, you've you've mentioned repurposing a lot, but is there a hidden piece that is, and the bits we can't repurpose, we're just going to sell um, because a lot of oil and gas companies, when you look at their plans for net zero, they sound marvelous, but then you probe and you push and you do the numbers and you say, do you know what? There is no way they can achieve that. 
other than by selling. And of course, if somebody else buys, who may be a private equity player, not publicly quoted, not facing the same scrutiny, uh, we've achieved nothing. I can only speak about my own company. Our plans are not to sell. I mean, of course, if there's some underperforming asset because it doesn't sort of, you know, retail asset here and there, we may say, okay, we don't need that because, you know, the, the game of retail has changed. But I mean, fundamentally, our business uh, strategy, which we laid out on the 4th of July, is all about, you know, keeping our existing assets of 50 assets and actually repurposing them for the future. And, um, you know, I personally do agree with you. I mean, the idea that if you sell it and it be good for the company, but it's not good for the world, if indeed our target is to move towards uh, decarbonization, uh, but, but that's not for me to comment on our strategy. And we've got conviction on this based on our assets and the, um, the nature of the markets we operate in, uh, where we believe we can actually convert our facilities and therefore, you know, uh, you know, generally uh, reduce uh, the carbon to net zero uh, by 2040. Uh, there are potentially some quite difficult decisions. Um, so one might be somebody offers to buy one of your refineries to keep running it with hydrocarbons, with fossil fuels. Would Does that mean you would say no, even if that might look like a very attractive deal versus doing something else, doing the, the clean version of repurposing? Well, I mean, fundamentally, we think our assets, our manufacturing hubs, are actually going to be vital to creating, you know, value. So, um, you know, if we actually believed that those assets would be better served as um, hydrocarbon assets uh, beyond 2040, then we probably would have had a different strategy. So uh, we actually believe there is a massive opportunity. We are in the process of in buying oil, for example, uh, putting in a green uh, electrolyzer, putting in an electrolyzer for green hydrogen, 125 megawatts going up to 800. Um, we are sort of in the process of putting in uh, a pretreatment unit for uh, bioenergy uh, in our asset in Crescia. I mean, we believe we can build scale in these businesses. And to build scale, because scale is very important. For us, scale is incredibly important. And I've I, you know, this Michael, I spent a lot of time in this area in my career. I actually believe this is not some nice, you know, niche LVMH product, uh, which, you know, serves a few um, uh, select niche customers. We've got to build scale to reduce costs and to make it more and more affordable. That's the winning ticket. And therefore, we believe that we can build scale in these businesses by both repurposing while also building uh the, the new the other thing i want to just point out just two other points if i may on that i also believe you know when you think about the history of our industry over 100 years and you know this extremely well but just for your viewers uh and for the listeners you, you know there was a sort of very john rockefeller like integrated model approach so refineries tended to be near uh the production source and near industrial clusters that's the way it was um, and so what we absolutely believe as we build these businesses in existing infrastructure, we have the benefit of the ecosystem, which we can leverage. I mean, think of it, if I'm taking 70% of my hydrogen demand in Switzerland, converting that to green, well, guess what? I've got the scale now to supply, you know, power to supply industry, etc. cetera. Um, and I think that's a very important point. The second point I'd also make is, and I think the current sort of turmoils in the labor market that you've seen, and frankly, the political discourse are born out of, you know, a three decade trend where some parts of society got left behind and with globalization. And I think there is there has to be uh, an opportunity here to to reskill people and to give you know them new opportunities. I mean, I think you know, when you go back in time in the UK, the coal mines got shut, but what happened to the coal miners? So, you know, we've got to think about ways to kind of create that, you know, it's the social cohesion, but it's also, frankly, a great business opportunity because I, I need the engineers. I need people who understand, uh, you know, uh, high-tech manufacturing. I need people who understand high-risk industries and they have those skills. And, you know, those men and women will be incredibly important as we start building out these businesses in the future on these platforms.
And, and one of those businesses is um, nature-based carbon. And that, of course, leads us into just this one thing I have to probe. Uh, we'll talk about the other four uh, in, in a moment. But to what extent are you going to rely on offsets to say, well, you know, we tried all these other businesses. They didn't scale. They We do what we can. Um, but we're hoping to, you know, plant trees and that will enable us to continue doing what we frankly, you know, have always done, which is hydrocarbons. It, it, is that a small part, a medium part, a big part? Is that any part of, of how you think about it? We are actually building that business for our customers, not for ourselves. You know, and I'll, let me explain that a bit more. So we, we actually think that uh, offsets, which are uh, certified, uh, which are genuine, um, you know, nature-based carbon solutions, we call them, uh, are part of the mix. I don't think they're going to be, and they cannot be, 100% the mix. That would be illogical and, frankly, would not actually you know, pass any kind of test in, 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 the, in the water cooler, so to speak. Uh, but uh, let's call it around 10% of the mix, perhaps, as a part of the transition, transition perhaps. Um, so what we are doing is we're building this business to basically provide a service to our customers. So we think by 2030, one gigaton CO2, uh, you know, will be kind of, you know, saved through this mechanism. Uh, our ambition is around 15 million tons uh, in our strategy in the next sort of few years, by 2026. And effectively, what we are seeking to do uh, is uh, provide this a, in a suite of things that we provide to our customers. We have this concept called customer lighthouses, and the and the idea is not you know the the old idea, which is let's just sell more to the customer. The question is how do we help them meet their own sort of transition needs? And ninety seven percent of the customers we serve in my markets have got some form of net zero commitments. Now the question is, and we believe, you know, because of our nimbleness, because of our entrepreneurship, because of the ways we do things, we can try and blend together their bio requirements, the hydrogen requirements, their e-mobility requirements, as well as some offset to help them in this pathway. So we see it in that context. It's not really a business we are building for ourselves. It's a build, business we are building to provide the customers with a suite of uh, options as they think about decarbonization. Okay, that's very clear. Thank you. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the green hydrogen of your five pillars in engine two. We've talked a little bit about the green hydrogen. We've talked about the nature based uh, solutions that leaves um, e mobility, biogas and biofuels. And I, I, and I think we don't have a huge amount of time, but you want to touch on uh, I'm particularly interested in the bio gas and the biofuels piece, but do you want to talk about those three? I'll do it very quickly. And, and you know, listen, even ability. Um, when I sort of joined Varo, you know, before you join, you know, you don't really meet anybody other than your board as a CEO. So um, once I was announced, I got the opportunity just to kind of go on a listening tour, if I may call it that. And the team spoke to me about this fintech company in mobility. And I'm thinking, why do we have a fintech company in mobility? Well, actually, what we do is we through a company called eFlux, we actually have the software that enables long distance holiers to, you know, have an ease of payments for their for their uh, energy needs. But it also then gives us a unique window to understand their requirements for bio, uh, it, it gives us a unique window in understanding the requirements as they electrify for power uh, and basically it allows us to try and bring together uh, options that they can you know, use as solutions uh, for their own needs, be it, um, and it's probably all of the above, for their uh, costs, for their uh, carbon, uh, as well as for their sort of, you know, optimization of their fleet. So. That's what we're doing. So we, what we're not doing is building a business where we've got sort of 10,000 retail outlets that we're going to put sort of e-charges e in. It's a good business for someone else. So one of the things we've been very clear about, I don't often go to the former prime minister of the UK, Theresa May, but I think she had a very good line about um, global citizens. She said there's sins of everywhere, but sins of nowhere. So what we don't want to be is a company that does everything. So our strategy is actually a strategy which is designed to make choice. 
uh, and we have made these choices on these five strategic pillars. So, you know, I was involved, as you know, Michael, from our own history in building uh, or being a part of a team that helped build a very large, in fact, now it's become the world's largest solar developer. Um, I was involved in offshore wind, onshore wind. These are great businesses. This would be light, light, BP Light Source. Correct. But yeah. the truth is, we don't have as Varo, uh, we have the expression which we use in our company, the right to win. We don't have a right to win in building utility scale solar. But we do have a right to win in these five areas based on what we've done. So it's a very focused strategy. Right, excellent. And, and that, that, that's very interesting. And in fact, uh, you know, I, I find the, the, the whole year, the whole area of freight and how we're going to do clean freight fascinating. And I didn't realize that was what EFLUX is doing. And, and I'll take a look at it. But just do um, biogas and biofuels, because they have fallen a bit out of favor. And in fact, around the time when we first started to work together on all of this stuff, you know, BP was investing in ethanol in Brazil and, and, and uh, we had the second generation ethanol kind of boom and everybody got excited. And now biofuels and sustainable airline fuels are having a bit of a comeback. Um, what is your take on those two remaining of your five pillars? So I think one of the things that I did say in the very beginning, and I need to uh, emphasize this again and again, we are investing in advanced biofuels. In other words, we believe that the opportunity ahead of us, and I'm going to use a bit of um, technical jargon, 2G, second generation uh, biofuels, is all about actually taking waste and agricultural residue, not impacting the food cycle. So it's not about crop, it's not about sort of, you know, uh, intermediates. It's actually about taking waste and converting that into useful heat lighted mobility. So the bio market in biofuels in Europe, we think is around a $70 billion market in the next uh, few years. Uh, we want to build that business. So we are also very active in building out our business in sustainable aviation fuels. It's uh, one of those hard to decarbonize sectors. We're working and you'll see some announcements uh, are working with some of our customers on that. Um, and the scale we're looking at, you know, 250,000 tons for our plant will actually sort of, you know, result in, well, I think, equivalent of uh, 4,000 uh, flights between uh, Heathrow and, and, and JFK to be absolutely clean. Um, similarly, I think what we're doing is in, in biomethane and bio LNG is looking to build businesses which are sort of using effectively non-crop um, feedstock. Um, so we've got a, which is now in the public domain, an agreement on crude fatty assets from uh, Finland, which we have now you know, done a deal with a fantastic company called uh, Taliari and Fintoil. Uh, we're building, you know, the feedstock, which we can then deploy into biomethane, biology. Again, very important. We think the potential of what we've laid out in terms of the business, um, you know, has the potential of, you know, basically uh, resulting in uh, essentially one 400,000 clean homes uh, in the next five years. Um, and again, that, that becomes a bit more vivid in people's sort of understanding of what we are trying to do. So we want to help, you know, uh, build those businesses. Uh, we think we've got the skill set around uh, not only those businesses, but also around how we optimize it, feedstock, trading, manufacturing, reliable manufacturing, and, and also, of course, building out, um, you know, the appropriate um, the appropriate sort of, you know, distribution channels. So, you know, it's one terawatt hours is what we're talking about, uh, you know, which is what, 110 million cubes uh, is what we are building out in, in the biogas business. And again, looking at sort of, um, you know, uh, very importantly, uh, looking at sort of existing infrastructure. I mean, don't forget some of these businesses and what I like about them is this is a transition. But the truth is that, you know, the bio business is never going to move the dial 100%. But if you move the dial 10% and you can use existing engines, for example, in transportation, but you're clean and you're not actually impacting the food cycle or the crop cycle, then, then actually you're creating a business that's well worth investing in. Can I ask a hypothetical question? Sure. Supposing capital was more constrained. I mean, you've you've got your plan. You're going to be investing three and a half billion uh, dollars, I believe it is. I think it's yeah. dollars. Not well, although dollar and Swiss franc is pretty much the same uh, between now and 2026. So it's it's a kind of around a billion dollars a year. And and uh, uh, and we've talked about all the conditions. That, okay, this is good. Supposing capital is a bit more constrained. My hypothetical question, and you had to choose between bio and hydrogen. 
Which would you choose? I think the business of hydrogen will be very important in terms of own usage in the next five years. Five years beyond that. But this uh, is replacing, just to be clear what it, that means for our, our listeners, this is replacing grey, i.e. dirty, polluting, emitting hydrogen in your, particularly in Cressier, presumably, or in both and, and, and in Bionol, and yeah. replacing that with, with um, some form of clean hydrogen, right? Green hydrogen, which is based. Green hydrogen. Again, I mean, the theme here is nature-based. So you yeah. think of strategy, there's a big sort of theme around nature, bio, bio, green hydrogen, uh, nature-based carbon solutions. So basically the bio business for us is going to be a good business in terms of our own usage. That will give us the scale that will allow us to then sort of go to industry, to power, even the mobility, depending on sort of how that evolves. Um, and I know you've got some various views on that, but 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 let's see. Uh, but I think the first homework question is not, it goes back to my own sort of mindset, my team's mindset. We will see what happens in 2070, 2050, but what can we do now? Well, we can do a lot with our existing infrastructure, and then that gives us options for the future. The bio business is different. It actually the business which is the here and now today. And I think we can invest in that and actually create scale in that business to serve our customers because demand is is very much out there. The question is going to be how do you build it at a scale in the right geographies, uh, leveraging, if you will, the incentives to do so. Uh, and I think that becomes a financeable proposition. Listen, you know, you talk about finance when you've got you, you look at the offshore wind business by having a CFD, what you give is reality is what the UK government gave was price certainty to the um, the producer. It also created a financing stream. Yeah, and, and that's, that's the idea that we need to get after. And my my my, my last question is about finance, um, and it is a question around returns because this is uh, this has been a perennial issue, and you know you've lived it when you were at BP. Uh, and I'm interested to know where it's coming, where it's getting to now. Do you have to give up returns? Is this a financial compromise? Is this, look, the glory days of energy are over because you can no longer do oil and gas and dump this pollutant into the, into the planet and that's over. And we just have to accept that this is now lower margin. Uh, we can try and de-risk, we can do clever things, but fundamentally the glory days of energy are over and any investors who are looking for that are going to find themselves fundamentally disappointed. Is that a true? Is that is that uh, how is that what's happening, or is something else happening? Well, what we have said is that as we sort of build out these businesses, um, we will maintain across the group a fifteen percent returns. So we have actually said we're not going to go build. And this is return on capital. This is not return on sales. Return on capital. Return on capital employed. Yeah. So what we're basically saying is that, you know, having a new brand new business where you tank margins and you tank returns, I mean, that's not going to be a winning proposition. So we believe there is opportunity for us to do so. Uh, and and you know, in these five areas uh, where we've got, as I said, a track record and, you know, some skill set that we can deploy. Um, and so 15% is what we are committed to delivering across the portfolio. So the very idea that we're going to build quantity by degrading quality is kind of not in line with our sort of strategy. Now, are the returns characteristics of this business different from uh, existing hydrocarbons? You bet. You know, look at the cyclicality we have had right now. Look, I mean, look at the VIX of the volatility uh, index of this uh, of hydrocarbons versus other forms of energy. It is a lot higher, and therefore, you know, and the reason it's a lot higher is because it is highly concentrated in the hands of producers. We've got to change it. Um, if you're, a, especially if you're sitting in our neighborhood where we are sitting today in Europe, where you know Europe is going to always be in need of energy. Uh, and the question is, can it produce more domestic energy uh, and can it diversify more of its sources? If it can, I think we would sort of see this episode as, you know, and I really hope this is the case, as the point of departure from the past. And that's what we're all trying to do. Using, you know, this current narrative, uh, which is born out of incredible sadness and tragedy, but how do we then create strength uh, as we move forward? 
That is, I think, what's ahead of us. And I think this is a, one of those, a cliche that may sound, one of those watershed, watershed moments for the world of energy. And I hope the choices we make today as individuals, as companies, as governments, as society can actually result in a future that is a lot more diverse, a, a lot more uh, inclusive of different forms of energies, and frankly, uh, providing, if you will, what the world actually needs, which is clean, affordable, and secure energy. Clean, affordable, secure energy. I mean, I, I could listen to you for um, days, but sadly, we're out of time. Um, thank you very, very much. I think that has been an incredibly um, you know, insightful uh, tour of actually what it means, what the transition means, not just a clean bit and not just how we don't want, not just what we want to do and what we don't want to do, but actually how we get from A to B. Uh, and I hope that the audience will really appreciate it. So I, I thank you for your time today. Well, Michael, thank you. And, and, and thank you actually for what you've done for um, our industry, because I think you've been pushing uh, over many decades. And I think uh, the things you've been pushing on are finally coming together in a very, very good way. And I hope in a very good way. I think it is actually a very good way. So thanks for leading in the thinking. Uh, you're a pioneer and here we are following your footsteps and hopefully we can do something with it. You're, you're, you're much too kind, but it's a pleasure spending a little bit of time with you nevertheless. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. So that was Dev Sanyal, CEO of Faro Energy Group and 32 year veteran of BP. My guest next week, is Dr. Jennifer Holmgren, CEO of Lanzatech, and that is a world leader in taking flows of waste carbon of various sorts and turning them into high value biofuels. Please join me at this time next week for a conversation with Dr. Jennifer Holmgren. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation.